compared to d times r, which is really small. And but it's not only the sensitivity of the experiment is actually reduced um, with respect to parallel plates, but also it is very difficult to characterize the surface locally, uh, meaning that you have local <coughs> patch potentials, maybe uh, local chemical disturbances in the surface, and they contribute very strongly to the force you measure. So that's uh, quite a strong disadvantage. In this talk, I will focus on the parallel plate ex uh, experiments, and um, here you have where is the big advantage that you have? Large interacting areas. So your sensitivity is inherently large. And with that also an average income of the surface problem. So for example, the patch potential, as has been also published by Bionin and others, um, is averaged out so you have less problems with these kind of interactions. And of course, it's also quite an ideal theoretical situation. So this is... Um, rather close to what you have in the derivation of the ideal Lipschitz formula, parallel slabs, so you come quite close to that. There is, however, also a downside, and uh, if the slide would be larger, I could continue this list of disadvantages here quite uh, down to maybe, I don't know, the basement. But that, of course, creates again the question, so why are you then doing parallel dates? It's so difficult. And in order to understand that a bit better, maybe let's have a look at uh, the questions for which we actually need or would need higher sensitivity. <coughs> and one is, um, we have discussed a lot about this here, the thermal Casimir effect, thermal contribution to the Casimir effect, large distances. I explicitly don't say Jude or plasma because um, in this point I agree completely with Steve that um, I think that both models are actually because they don't come from first principles not really physical interpretations, they're effective models, we can use them, but still they are not really physical. And so I think whatever comes out at large distance will be interesting in terms that we, can, that we have something to interpret, uh, which might be different than at short distances where we have already quite a lot of data. Um, well, the second point, this is actually a bit more important for our experiment, is to set new limits on non newtonian forces uh, specifically a model which is called chameleon. I will come back to that. And if we look at what we actually need in order to get reasonable data, which uh, does something for theorists, is that we need to measure a distance is larger than 10 micrometer. So that's really a large distance with a precision of uh, 0 0.1 piconewton or better. Well, if we can achieve that, then it's clear that we can also make a Casimir measurement at large distances. Uh, but that's not all. There are more points to this. If you have parallelism, then you have even the opportunity to measure, for example, in different geometries. We have a feedback mechanism that keeps objects parallel. So we could, for example, also measure in these geometries. And that, for example, would give valuable input to validate new methods of calculating, like, for example, the one who uh, were presented. So if we get real experimental data in these geometries where there's real parallelism, I think that would be a quite uh, large advantage. There are also other interactions uh, which benefit a lot from parallel plates, but I will not talk about these in um, this talk. So, okay. When you start a new experiment, what you want is, of course, always kind of a manual. You need a list of things, what you need to do, what you need to buy, how to set up the entire experiment. And in this case, what we want to have is cooking recipe for uh, 0.1 piconewton parallel plates experiment at large distance. Uh, with probably variable pressure, whatever. So the first thing you have to come up with is a grocery list of things you need. And on this grocery list, we would have a force transducer, which allows us to be sensitive enough. The force transducer needs to work together with a detection system. In this case, we chose for a capacitive detection system, uh, similar to Chris. Um, you need to note that here we have 10 to the minus 8 relative sensitivity, so that's really at the uh, verge of uh, technical impossibility. Um, we have parallelism control, we need ultra flat surfaces, and we need very good vibrations. So all these points need attention. And um, we are already five years into the project, uh, about the same order of magnitude as Ricardo with his uh, experiment, but we are not yet there. And it's very difficult. Anyway, if you follow a bit this uh, recipe and you get all the stuff together, then this, this is what you come up with. Um, that's a huge tank just for the scale. This is about 2 meter 20 high. The actual experiment is done here in the center in something which we call the core chamber, 
when we can change the pressure or go to high vacuum. This chamber is suspended on a one meter 80 long pendulum. And at the other end of the pendulum, there is a seismic filter. This seismic filter is built into a huge vacuum chamber, big one here, which is standing in the basement of our university in a clean room. You know? And for, the, for now, I would like to focus first on this core here. And in the core, we have the extra measurement. Just to give you an impression of how we actually measure, well, we have two plates, as I said. Uh, a very simple mass spring system uh, which suspends one of the plates. If you have a force between the plates, you will see a change in the displacement, which you can measure capacitively. Um, currently, we measure with a commercial bridge like this. Um, it's not very accurate, it gives us approximately, in theory, I have to say, a force resolution of one uh, bigger Newton. We have means of improving that, specific options. And there are also plans to use differential bridges, <coughs> which we would uh, increase the sensitivity. Um, the sensor, which is here, looks actually like this. So it's a microfabricated membrane, thickness 100 micrometer from silicon, gold coated. Here you have one square centimeter, a central disc, that is the upper plate. Then you have these spiral shaped springs, which are optimized for the task at hand. And the waviness of the central disc has been measured to be 15 nanometer over the entire surface. This would be a photo of the first prototype. This was laser cut, but we have also tried other methods of fabrication. This is um, a result of the uh, first characterization which we had. So we see very low resonance frequency. The blue line is an American model for the sensor we had, and um, the black dots are extra measurements. If you see that they fit very well with the model. From this, we concluded that our model is able to predict uh, really all the mechanical properties of the system. Um, then we have the plates. Plates are from silicon dioxide. They are optically flat also, gold coated. This is an actual measurement of uh, an optical profiling meter. And also here you see the scale is 18 nanometer over the entire surface. So, okay. This would be the assembly. It's open here. There's additional sheeting, which is not shown. Um, here you see the sensor. It's shining through the uh, springs. You can see also the plate underneath here. These big blocks here, here, and here, they are actually uh, piezo actuators with which we can set the distance and also set the tilt between the plates. That's very important. I will come to that later. And if we then look at our list again, we already have four transducers. So we have very flat surfaces. We need still to improve a bit on the detection system, but we have a pretty good idea on how to do it. So the next point is parallelism. Okay, why would you need parallelism anyway? Well, if you calculate the capacitance which you have between the plates for certain tilt angles at certain distances which you have, then you see that there is quite large influence. And that is a problem because we measure the force and the distance capacity. So if you have an error in C in the capacitance, then you also have an error in the distance, and you also get an error in the force, which you don't want. And if you make the math and you have a look at what you actually need in order to be able to be sensitive enough to have 0 0.1 piconewton accuracy, then you see that you got 0 0.1 microradian. To give you an idea, that is about 0 0.1 millimeter on the length of a soccer field. So that's really not a lot. Okay. We have a mechanism that keeps parallelism. It works approximately like this. You have two plates, and you introduce a tilt on one of the plates, like this. And then you change the angle of the tilt. You don't rotate, you just change the angle. Then, if the amplitude of the tilt is constant, then also the capacitance is constant under this movement. If you have an offset, so one of the plates is tilted, then you would measure a larger capacitance in this position than in this position. That gives you a modulation. You can use this modulation in order to drive a feedback circuit. But that actually works. This would be the feedback circuit. I don't go into details here, it's a bit complicated. But this is the result of a test we have made. This time with fixed plates, so not floppy, uh, floppy disks, but uh, fixed plates because it was a prototype. We gave it a single sided kick, right large, 6 micrometer. And then we watched what the system does, and you see it goes quite quick to equilibrium. What we reach on the long term is 3 microradian with this system, but you have to consider that this was without any preparation system and uh, in a rather crude prototype. So we are pretty sure that we can reach this target. Okay, 
going back to the list, we also have a mean for uh, variables in control. We are not yet there. We have like the 10 above the target we need, but it's already quite good. So the last point on the list is vibration insulation. That turns out to be very important. This is an actual measurement of the seismic background, which we have at our experiment, the blue line, in comparison with the Brownian noise of our sensor, expressed as force spectrum on our sensor. But the actual measurement level, so the target level of the forces which we want to measure, <coughs> is somewhere down here. And you can, of course, be clever and use a small band detection scheme, like a frequency shift, or also measuring at near DC with uh, approximately <coughs> 1 over 100 hertz. And you go a bit up with your requirement because you can average over the noise, but that doesn't help with the physical noise because if the sensor vibrates a lot, you still have problems. So finally, the requirement is to get this noise down by 20 decibel in amplitude. Okay. Now, how do we achieve that? This would be a sketch of the actual system we have for vibration insulation. Again, you see the core hanging on the pendulum. Against vertical seismic vibrations, we have a system of Euler springs here, which gives a passive system. I can talk about um, them in a bit more detail if you have questions. It's uh, aided by an active system using a voice coil and uh, geophone detectors. Against horizontal seismic uh, vibrations, we have a combination of two pendula, actually. So you have the first pendulum where the core is hanging on, and then you have a second pendulum which is interacting with the first one by any current dampers. The reason for that is that we want to damp out resonances of the system that brings down the noise further. Okay, the, the only problem we have now is that um, due to some technical problems at our university, we don't have all these systems up and running, so a few of them are missing, and that is really a huge problem for us, as we can do these measurements. So now black is the reference on ground uh, in vertical and horizontal direction, and blue is the actual measurement with passive anti-vibration. You can see that in certain frequency ranges, here in the vertical direction, we already reach the target, but then you also see that there are these peaks here, here, here. And these peaks, they are really a problem. Why? Because our sensor has a resonance frequency of 11.2 hertz. So the effective bandwidth of the sensor is about 20 hertz, and it integrates up all the way from zero to these 20 hertz, and unfortunately in this range you have all these resonances. So our sensor actually picks up all the resonances and creates a huge RMS noise, for which we cannot approach distances small at 50 micrometer at the moment. So it is a temporal problem because we know how to solve it, but we need to get there, of course. And the, the target which we eventually have <coughs> is uh, here. So in the vertical direction, we want to go down with you know, over the entire spectrum down to the, the Brownian noise, which is this line here. And in the horizontal direction, the target is a bit relaxed because we have only approximately 5% coupling between horizontal and vertical modes of our sensor. So it can be a bit more relaxed. So looking again at the list, it doesn't look that good. We have vibration insulation, but actually at the moment it makes the situation worse than it would be without, but we know how to solve that. Okay. Anyway, in the meantime, we performed some performance tests. So this is a typical DC measurement where you have the parabolas of the electrostatic force when you apply a DC potential to your plates and you measure them by the capacitance. The response, also here you see that we couldn't go closer than 55 micrometer without touching. And if you then make a parabola fit and you evaluate the noise, what you get then is something like 10 nanonewtons, so that is a bit disappointing. That is four orders of magnitude above where we actually want to be. But it's quite easily to explain that, because if you take the seismic measurements which I had before and you go through the transfer functions which you have measured, then you end up actually exactly at this level. So really it is the vibration which is at the moment a big roadblock for us. So regarding the status, we do have an experiment. We have technical solutions for all the big problems which are there. They are not yet implemented completely, but uh, partial systems are up and running, and the big roadblock which we have at the moment are vibrations. Okay, but let's assume for a moment that we can solve this vibration problem. Then what could we reach? If we assume that we just have electronic noise from our bridge, and we have the thermal noise, or the noise from our sensor, then we can do a bit math, and then we see what is the actual force resolution we can reach. 
If you look at the graph, it tells us that 10 micrometer distance, it's the blue curve. With the current setup as it is, we could reach 1.2. <coughs> If we make small improvements, meaning at the bridge circuit and a bit of larger mass of our, of our sensor to reduce Brownian noise, we could go down by a factor of four approximately. So these are the current limits. There are ideas how to go further, but first I would like you to follow me into the second part of the talk on the dark side of our universe. And I don't think that after the talk which we had before, of Emilio, I need to talk a lot about this diagram. You have seen it before, I guess. It means that the baryonic and daptonic mass in our universe is just 5%. Then we have dark matter, which is from the large contribution and the major part coming from dark energy. And as we have discussed before, there's actually not really an indication of how that really works. We have the cosmological constant, of course, but we don't know really how it works. So there are a few propositions. We have had a long list. This would be one of them. In 2004, Kuri and Beltman have suggested to add a new scalar Yukawa interaction to the standard model. So what you do is you have the standard model, you change it, and you add additional dynamics. It looks like this. So what you have here is in the photon sector, you add exponential terms here with a coupling beta. This would be the mass sector with a possibly a different coupling that doesn't need to be different. And then you have additional dynamics. The ones of you who know a bit about general relativity see that this is basically the Einstein-Hilbert action with the cosmological constant being replaced by the dynamics of the new scale. Well, what you can do then is clear. You can uh, derive the equations of motion for the field, and um, you see that they take a particularly simple form if you define an effective potential. But the most important part here to notice is that both of them depend on mass density or energy density in which you are. And that is quite peculiar about this model. If we have a closer look at the effective potential, it contains a runaway potential, uh, like 20 cents, which basically creates the uh, acceleration. And then we have these Yukawa couplings. And because they add up, we have an effective potential, which has a minimum. This minimum depends on the actual density, because if the density is lower, then this is more shallow, and the minimum is uh, more on this side. Anyway, you can define from this minimum a mass for the field. This mass is also uh, depending on the energy density. And finally, you can solve this to get the potential in space for this model. Well, OK, that's a lot of math. And what does that actually mean? The interpretation is rather simple. If you are in space, in free space, and you have a very low energy density, then you have a strong interaction. Why? Because the exponential term basically goes to 1. Mass is very small. If you are in or near a large massive object, and that means just being inside a galaxy is already enough, then you have the mass being much larger than one, and you would have suppression. So the interaction is inversely dependent on the energy. And for this property of the model, it is stopped chameleon because it adapts to the local environment. Anyway, how can we measure that? Well, the idea which we had was that you take a Casimir experiment, parallel plates, and you immerse the entire experiment in a gas. The gas creates a varying energy density change. And if you then calculate what you expect, if you have various pressures, you would be the force change. Uh, then you see that for classical forces, meaning electrostatics, gravitation, Casimir force, you would see an increase in the force. If you think that there is a chameleon, then you would have a decrease depending on the coupling parameter. That is a qualitative, uh, qualitative difference, and this makes the, the experiment potentially very sensitive to this interaction. If you look at the scales, they are very well experimentally accessible. Many bar is not a problem. Here, we meet again this 0 0.1 picometer. OK. Now, let's have a look at uh, what we can actually achieve. I didn't calculate this. This was uh, from our theoretical colleagues. Um, if we reach this uh, 1.2 piconewton, which I've already mentioned, then we are uh, approximately at the same level as the best upper limit, which is coming from atom interferometry. If we can go down to 0 0.3, we can improve this limit by two orders of magnitude. And the, re the really peculiar fact about our experiment is that if we could reach 0 0.1 piconewton, we could entirely rule out this model. This is something 
a prospect which no other experiment has. And this is uh, due to the particular configuration which we have and this mass change because it's really sensitive to the action mechanism which the model uses. So this is actually the carrot which keeps us going on, that we could really exclude this model. And uh, with that I would like to come to my conclusions. So we have a parallel plate experiment. We have solutions for all the basic problems. We just have one major roadblock at the moment, which is vibrations. Um, with the setup as it is now, we will attempt to measure a distance as larger than 10 micrometer with one piconewton sensitivity. It will give interesting data uh, possibly to the Casimir community. We could, for example, stitch together the data which we have at small distances with this and then compare that to theory. It would be quite interesting. And we can possibly exclude one of the most um, good looking um, theories which we have for dark energy. So, with this, I would like to thank you and, uh, of course, also all the people which have worked on. Oops. Which have worked on this project, it's actually quite a lot. And also my special thanks to the Julian Schwinger Foundation which allowed me to be here. So thanks. So Linnea, thank you very much for the interesting talk. The talk is open to questions that you might have. Yes, Steve. So when you tilt your plates, is one plate much bigger than the other, or you know, otherwise it have to be centered very Precisely for the capacitance. Yeah, they are centered very precisely. We do that by shifting them and checking the capacitance. But you always have a problem, of course, that you also need to be parallel. So it's a bit like dragging yourself out of the loft to do both at the same time. But that actually works pretty well. We also check it um, with laser interferometry from the top uh, that everything is aligned properly. You know, we tried to do that early on and doing it by hand is impossible. So if you have a computer program which looks like you have it, just does it automatically otherwise. Yeah. was impossible. That's true. The, the other problem we had is, like, if the edges were rough, you get sort of an anomalous signal. You, are your parts really very smooth? Or? Our edges are not perfect, I have to say. So there is always, because of um, the methods you use to get them optically flat, some break off at the side, but it's very minimal. And we don't see any asymmetry effect. So we checked when we made the mechanism for the parallelism. Because if there is an intrinsic asymmetry, then you, could, then you cannot reach parallelism. We checked that optically and didn't see any asymmetry. Thank you. Yes, sir. What do you mean with the sensitivity? Is uh, there a question of a parameter like between minus 1 and minus 1 over C? Sorry, what was it? The quintessence yeah. region. What is the definition? Is there will be a uh, line between minus 1 and minus 1 over C? So? Uh, which parameter are you referring to? question of state parameter. Oh, this I don't know. No. It, you have to ask our theoretical colleagues. I didn't make the calculations. Yes. Uh, yes, please, uh, Francesco. Uh, thank you, Renato, for this. Nice so view of uh, the experiment. It's amazing what you can do nowadays. Um, so I'm actually curious about the difficulties that uh, could occur when you put your experiment in a gas. Yes. And uh, um, so how can you control like the position absorption of the gas or all these parasitic effects that could occur? The parasitic effects are really a large problem. What we try to do is uh, doing everything on very long time scales. That helps a lot because most of the effects are temporal. Right? Because, um, of course, if you absorb something in the, in the surface, it could change the directing properties. That is something which you should check extra. But this can be checked. It will be done. But in principle, you have, for example, problems with um, thermal expansion. So that means that the temperature really must be very stable. And uh, you could have, of course, problems that you have films building up on the surface, whatever, but most of these are actually temporal. So what we do in order to avoid this or bring it down to a limit is measuring very slowly. So for the Chameleon experiment, we had a uh, time constant of 1,000 seconds and more, so that everything is really always adiabatic and that everything is in perfect equilibrium. So I would 
One more question, please. Ricardo? Yes? Uh, Rene, what is the Q of your system and what is the limiting factor in the Q? Which system? The, the membrane or the... The membrane. The membrane. Well, we have quite um, varying results. It depends very much on the production method. Um, strangely, with uh, laser cut membranes, which we had for testing purposes, we had Q factors between 500 and 1000, which is really nice. Um, with wet etching, we had just between 100 and 200. We don't know for which reason, Re reason because the um, surfaces and also the edges are actually better defined, so you would expect that there are less problems, but still it doesn't work so nicely. And then we have uh, tried reactive iron etching, and that actually gives the most stable results, but then the Q factor is around uh, 300. I think that the limiting factor is the gold coating which you have on top, because the silicon itself um, is actually really flexible, so you, could, you can with uh, pure silicon oscillate this, achieve easily 500 to 1000 with a Q factor, but the gold on top is really deadly. So the more gold you have, the lower the Q factor is. So at the moment we have 70 nanometer on the membranes. I don't think that we can uh, reduce that for the Cosmic experiments, but for the, ca uh, for the chameleon experiments we actually want to reduce this layer just to have a conductive layer on the surface, nothing else. I think that's the most important. Let's thank one more time, Renee.